Hello and welcome back to season three of the Biome podcast. Um, it's just me today, just Kate, and you might be able to tell I'm in a slightly different location if you're watching this on YouTube. So I have now moved to the Maldives to start a new job, which is kind of what this podcast is about. So I'm joined here with Emily Coral, and we are going to be talking about coral restoration in the Maldives. So Emily is a marine biologist, um, and that's kind of the work I'm doing over here as well. Um, so Emma and Roby are back in England, so they are not joining for this podcast. So it's just going to be the two of us. So do you want to start by just sort of introducing yourself and what you do here in the Maldives? So I'm the, one of the marine biologists of Rescapers, which is a marine consultancy company in the Maldives. Um, I'm based at the Sheraton Full Moon Resort and Spa. Which is where we right are. Right here, <laughs> <laughs> with the ocean right behind us. Okay, and so I do a lot of uh, coral restoration, education for the guests and the staff, and a lot of like education for the kids to learn about the ocean and why it's important to protect the ocean. Amazing. Yeah. So do you want to start again as well by saying what a coral actually is? Because I think this is something I've noticed since coming here that a lot of people don't actually know. Yeah, so most of the people will think a coral is actually a plant because it can look like a plant, but it's actually an animal. Um, so a coral is actually, you have a lot of individual polyp. So polyp is the animal uh, itself. It's like a microscopic individual where you have the mouse, the so tentacles um, outside of the mouse and the whole like digestive system inside. Um, when a coral grow, they create like layers of calcium carbonate, so like they actually create and build their own skeleton. And the more polyp you have, the bigger the colony actually gets. So with time, from one f small fragment, uh, you will have a big colony that grows and then create a new habitat for um, the fish or like all the marine life. Um, but the interesting part is that they actually live in a symbiotic relationship with an algae that we called zooxanthellae. Um, this algae lives inside the tissue of the cores um, and is providing nutrients to the cores using the sunlight. Um, so kind of like the same system as plant. And in exchange, the coral is providing a home, so a safe place to live for the algae. And basically, the way it works is a symbiotic relationship, so they cannot live without, the, like, without each other. Um, so if the algae leaves and exits, uh, is expelled from the coral, then the coral could actually bleach and die. But if the algae comes back, like let's say the water condition, um, are like the water is getting, the temperature is getting higher, and then it goes down again, if the algae comes back, then the coral can get its coral back and be healthy again. Yeah, so the process of coral bleaching is actually really tied to the algae as much as it is to the coral. Yeah, so coral bleaching, um, it can be that corals can recover from coral bleaching and same way they can actually die from coral bleaching. So it's either um, they recover or they don't recover. Mm. And so when you say coral restoration, how do you want to explain how at Reefscapers we are restoring coral in the Maldives? Yeah, so basically we have coral frame, which I see you can see kind of, it's just right here, but it's a small island. Uh, we have some coral frame, so it's kind of a metal frame with layer of sand, uh, natural sand on top of it that we attach uh, on the frame. And the idea is to actually put fragment, a uh, small coral fragment on the frame that then will create a new colony and restore the reef around different islands. Um, so what we do is that we have different size of frame. Depending on the size, we can put different number of coral fragments on the frame. So then once the coral fragment is small, they have enough space to grow on the frame. Um, what we do is that we have a coral nursery here at the Sheraton and in other resorts in the Maldives. And we have like say like a big colony we collect like one or two fragments from uh, the the colonies that we have and this fragment we attach it back on the frame again this way the fragment is going to grow it's going to create new branches and over time you're going to have a new colony which is uh, genetically identical than the previous one the main idea of the frame is that when the coral respawn which we actually have eggs at the moment uh, yeah, here at the Sheraton, yeah uh, when they spawn, they will release egg and sperm, and then you will have new larvae and then new corals uh, back on the reef. Yeah, I think that's the thing I find most interesting about the project is that it's by increasing the amount of coral in the ocean through the process of restoration, we are basically increasing the likelihood of successful spawning and therefore hopefully more and more coral. So 
Yeah, I think that's really clever. Yeah, it is amazing because, I mean, here at the Sheraton, the colony is still really small because we've only had the project for two years. Uh, but in other resorts in the Maldives, um, obviously the calls I spawned actually like uh, a few weeks ago were calls from a frame, uh, which means that without the frame, we would have had less um, like eggs and sperm release in the ocean, so less chances to have um, mm. more corals back on the reef. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Yeah, it is. So why are coral reefs important? Um, coral reefs are important because most of the marine life, actually 25% of all marine life, relies on the coral reef. Um, so without coral reefs, the ocean will not actually be as healthy and the whole ecosystem of the ocean could actually collapse. Um, you have a lot of different species of fish, a lot of different species of corals, um, and all of that together creates a whole ecosystem for a lot of marine life. Um, they are very endangered uh, with the climate change, with the current uh, pollution that we have, with the plastic pollution. Um, so protecting coral reef is actually protecting the whole ocean um, as well. With that coral reef, then the ocean will not be as healthy and we will not be able to survive um, on Earth. Yeah, and an important thing about having healthy oceans, especially at the moment, is their ability to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They're probably the biggest ally in tackling climate yeah. change that humanity has. And so without healthy oceans, we really don't have a chance. And so having coral, healthy coral reefs means we have healthy oceans, which means we have this carbon sink that's right literally right on our doorstep yeah it's something that um people don't really understand uh, unless you've learned about it but most of it actually comes from the ocean obviously it comes from the tree as well but a lot of it come and most of it actually comes from the ocean um so if the ocean conditions are not uh, healthy and normal then we will not have enough um enough carbon dioxide to actually live on earth yeah and coral reefs are also considered quite an indicator ecosystem because they're so fragile and they're quite a key tipping point when talking about climate change. So coral reefs kind of serve as this almost like a um, glimpse into the future of what other could happen to other systems under climate change. So the kind of degradation and collapse we're seeing of coral reefs is what we will see of things like river deltas and other less vulnerable ecosystems. It's just happening to coral fur. So it's really important that we learn how to deal with it now so that we don't have to keep playing catch up yeah. with every other ecosystem as they kind of fall in this domino effect. Yeah, um, the thing with the coral reef is that you can actually, within like a few weeks, you can actually see a coral alive and you can then see it dead because it bleached yeah. and died. Um, if you go on the reef in the Maldives, actually, they've been really impacted and you can see sometimes, for example, a table coral that was once like a big uh, table coral. Mm -hmm. And then you can see it just become like, it just became a rock. Uh, so you only have the skeleton that was there left and then it's just a rock. Uh, so, you know, the coral is not there anymore and um, the whole uh, ecosystem is slowly like degrading, mm. basically. And coral bleaching is is linked to climate change. So how does climate change cause corals to bleach? Um, corals are really like, um, they need a lot of different things that has to be um, within their like condition. I don't know how to say this. <laughs> yeah, they kind of, corals need quite, they're quite fussy about what conditions they have to be healthy. Yeah, they're quite fussy about what they need. So the water temperature has to be specific. Uh, they need like a certain, like the light has to be correct. So not too much light, so not too shallow, but not too deep because then they don't get enough light. Uh, the nutrients in the water have to be specific as well. And all of that makes them really at risk of climate change. Um, if the water temperature goes up a bit, then they can bleach or like they're not, um, if they're not as resilient as other species, for example. Um, if there's too much light, uh, they can also bleach and then they can, can lead to like mortality. Um, so all of that, if you combine all the effect of climate change together, mm -hmm. then the coral reef are really at risk. Um, it's quite alarming to think that 25% of marine life is dependent on these very specific conditions. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fragile when you start thinking about it. It's quite scary. It is very scary, uh, but that's what we do as well, what we're doing. Um, coral restoration is one part, is one thing we can do to help uh, 
the coral reef ecosystem. It's obviously not everything, but without this, it will also be worse. So mm. by having coral frame and by like transplanting new fragments back on the reef, we are helping the whole ecosystem. Um, so it's about balancing the coral restoration and uh, how much we are protecting the ocean at the same time. So we just had to move inside because the wind picked up a lot um, and so that was all you were hearing on the microphone. So we're just going to pick back up <laughs> from where we were. Um, so you were talking about how when you arrived it was like a deep breath after lockdown and like coming to live in the Maldives and what you enjoy about it. Yeah, um, I mean for me, like I've been here for one year now and I absolutely love it. I mean for a marine biologist, Maldives is one of the best place to work in, I think. Um, we have a lot of marine life, we have a lot like uh, of diving sites, snorkeling sites around where it's like amazing, you see like manta, you see turtles, you see like sharks every day uh, as well. So it's pretty amazing um, to show that to the guests and also to the staff because it was the first time there were marine biologists on this island. Um, so for most of the time, that ha most of the staff that have been here for like some of them 10, 15, 20 years, um, it was something new and something for them to learn about what they have right here um, in front of them, basically. Um, but what I love the most about my job, um, obviously I love building the coral frame. Uh, it's putting new corals back in the ocean and we know we're like helping uh, to restore the coral reef. Um, but I think my favorite part is actually the education uh, for the guests. So, um, Whenever we have kids uh, that come to Maldives for the first time and you go with them snorkeling, it's the first time they see like sometimes the fish underwater, first time they see how colorful it is, how much uh, marine life there is underwater. You can see they're just really happy and then they just don't stop talking about it, basically. Yeah. Um, we also do like, well, both of us, we do like marine talk uh, here um, every, like most of the days. Um, and we have a lot of kids, a lot of families that come to all the talks that we have. They come here like even like 10 minutes before we arrive. They just wait. They want to hear what we have to say about like fish, dolphins or sharks. Um, and all of that is really rewarding uh, for us to know that what we do is actually impacting um, a kid's life. And you know he's going to remember all of that um, for probably the rest of his life. Yeah, I agree. It is really lovely how excited some people get about the coral people of all ages but obviously especially children and yeah. how interested people are it is it is really lovely to see um i definitely think my favorite part of the job though is getting to go in the water every day and seeing wildlife every day like you say after lockdown like if you're someone who loves wildlife it was hard like not being able to go outside sometimes or being kind of stuck in one place for such a long time so it's been it's so nice now that we're surrounded by wildlife all the time um, but yeah it is really exciting the, the kind of people side of it as well um yeah to come back for you say like the marine life is amazing and we can actually sit on the frame um mm -hmm. so i had holidays like about a month ago and when i came back we had a new species of fish that had actually made his home under the coral frame uh, so it's oriental sweet lips it's like a really nice fish with like uh, some yellow on the top um, and like 10 of them are now like living under the frame uh, that we have so after even only a year and a half you know that more and more fish are already in here and so after like five years or even more like yeah it's really rewarding actually to be able to see it in real time and even seeing the, the difference in the frames and and how many frames we've done because i made a note of the first frame that i did here so i'll know when i leave how many frames were done in that time and to see the frames that have been here for over a year versus the frames that we're planting now and how much bigger the corals are, like it's really, it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, you can see, like, if you go to the same place and every two weeks you check one coral fragment, mm -hmm. uh, that's what we actually start doing, and we take picture of uh, a fragment every, like, two weeks or, like, once a month, and you can see it grow, and that's when you know that what you're doing actually has a positive impact, like, right now. Um, obviously in the long term as well but right now like within a few days or weeks you can actually see um, something being created yeah uh, that's really rewarding yeah when i first arrived it wasn't like that uh, we only had 50 frames uh, and now when i see what we have like guests can stay like snorkel for one hour yeah. uh, we can stay there all day as well yeah. so <laughs> yeah. yeah we can yeah <laughs> and we do we do yeah <laughs> Do you think restoration projects like this are 
kind of the future of conservation or do you think or hope that we'll get to a point where we can actually just prevent the loss of decline of these kind of ecosystems so we can actually better conserve them in their natural state rather than have to restore them? Um, I believe it will obviously be better if uh, the ocean was not um, under like such stress uh, all the time in like every everywhere in the world and that we would not need uh, coral restoration um, it's been more than 20 30 40 50 years that uh, we know the ocean conditions are not what they were before so slowly with time coral restoration started in a lot of countries and people started to like try different techniques uh, on how to restore coral reefs um, it's really good, it's amazing, you can actually see the difference it has um, in like different locations in the world. But I think if we didn't need it, it would be even better. Um, I think the main thing to focus as well would be to find a way to not um, have to do coral restoration. Because if the reef was not under stress, then we would not have to do all this job. And we could focus our job more on research about the coral reefs that we have, for example. Um, I believe we have to work with a lot of uh, government companies to try and um, have less impact, have less negative impact everywhere in the world. Um, what we're doing is great, but it's on a really small scale compared mm -hmm. to the whole uh, ocean and coral reef ecosystem. I think one of the main things would be education as well, um, especially in the Maldives, uh, plastic pollution is a big issue. Uh, people just tend to throw plastic uh, anywhere in the ocean because you think that what's in the ocean, you don't see it, so nothing is left behind basically. Um, but obviously, if you educate people on why you shouldn't do it and why it's important to actually recycle plastic or to use less and less plastic, um, then with time, the future generation will not do it and then with time all of that uh, will get better and better. Um, obviously it takes a long time but I can say it by uh, working here that a lot of people are slowly being aware of why they shouldn't do it and why um, plastic pollution is a big issue in the Maldives and why pollution is an issue. Um, I mean even for the corals they can like absorb like microplastic uh, inside so obviously even if tiny organism can have plastic inside them then how far can it go uh, yeah. and how much impact will it have on the whole ocean yeah i think that the fact that coral can ingest plastic is really important for people to understand because i think a lot of the talk around plastic in the oceans is big bits of plastic and that's because that's what we see yeah. and that's what people can film and that's what a lot has been captured but microplastics are actually the bigger problem and it's these tiny unseen microscopic bits of plastic that just don't break down and then a tiny individual coral polyp which as you said before is microscopic in size it's hard to see clearly with your with your eyes yeah that can eat that and then they can't digest it so it will just live inside them forever and it can be so damaging and that is isn't such an unseen problem that's happening on a global scale um so that's another you know it's so important that we figure out a way to use less plastic and to keep it out of the ocean and out of landfill. Yeah, and it's also a whole debate about whether we have to clean the ocean now and remove what, else, what is already in the ocean or do we have, or like obviously we have to focus on not producing as much plastic. Mm. Um, so like the coal restoration is great, but you also have to tackle another other issue mm. at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think both of them together uh, can work, but one of them alone will not be enough. So mm -hmm. if you focus on um, a lot of regulation, plastic uh, pollution and all of that, it's good, but at the same time, the coral reef will be um, damaged. Mm -hmm. So while you do coral restoration, then you can also work on um, the big picture about how to protect the ocean by working with either government, local communities, and then like different companies as well. Yeah, I agree. I think you need both simultaneously, especially where we are now, where so many ecosystems like coral reefs are degraded. We do need to restore them. We can't just focus on preventing others from degrading because we've already lost so much. So it's like, especially here in the Maldives, they've lost so much of their reefs um, from bleaching. 
And so we can't just focus on protecting what little is left. We have to build up what was lost so that it has even greater resilience. Yeah, and that's why like what we do at Reefscapers has actually a big impact. Um, because we see people from everywhere in the world and we talk to them about marine life and about why it's important, why we should protect it. And then they go back home and they will remember this conversation we've had with them. And then they will talk to their family and they will talk to different people that they know. And slowly with time, uh, more and more people are aware of it. Uh, I mean, that's what we both do. We do a lot of social media and communication for rescapers and um, I mean, I've been here for only one year, but I can see that more and more people uh, well, like, are following us on Instagram or on Facebook and are reacting to our posts and are learning about our project. Um, and through communication and education, uh, slowly more people are aware of it and more people will want to actually protect the ocean yeah. as well. It's something we've said on this podcast so many times that conservation is actually just about people, not really about wildlife and reaching out to people and involving people for all stakeholders from all different backgrounds as much as possible. It's a good point. I hadn't really considered that people from all over the world come to the Maldives. Like it is such a it's a, such a bucket list country for so many people and it's quite a unique country. And so we do, yeah, I've been here for yeah, less than a month and I've met people from Europe, North America, Asia, Australia, South America, pretty every pretty much every continent on the globe. And I've been here less than a month, yeah. so it's actually insane. <laughs> yeah, it is. And um, I mean, for my part, I am like I study like marine biology and conservation and biodiversity, and obviously I'm interested in research. But with time, I became more and more uh, attracted by the education and communication aspect of conservation in general. Um, and then some people at risk capers are more focused on the research uh, aspect of corals and the whole ecosystem so this way it actually works well together you have some scientists you have some people doing education and communication and then you have like a lot of different um, type of job within risk caper which makes it that uh, like with time it becomes something bigger and bigger basically yeah I, i've been the same i've become more and more attracted to the communication yeah. side i think it's really important yeah okay so i have two final questions that i want to end on okay firstly we have a lot of listeners who are in the kind of early stages of their career so they're either still studying recently graduated looking for their first job or just started their first job and when I was in that position, when I was at university, I found it really interesting hearing other people's, people who were already in the industry, their sort of journey. So you can give it as brief as you want, just a kind of rough background of your career. So what did you study? What other yeah. jobs have you had? How did you end up on a tropical island in the Maldives? Yeah, <laughs> good question. <laughs> uh, basically, so I studied in England, so I did a uh, master at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, an undergrad at the University of Portsmouth and then my master at the University of Exeter. Uh, so I did, uh, my undergrad was actually marine environmental science and then my master was conservation and uh, biodiversity. So during my undergrad I actually uh, went to Indonesia to study corals. Um, so it was for my uh, research project uh, during my third year of university. Um, and I was actually doing some research on two different species. So one of them was a branching coral and one of them was a boulder coral. And it was to see um, if one of them is more resilient to high temperature than the other one. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So obviously, boulder coral are more resistant than branching uh, yeah. coral. But that's why I really started uh, learning about corals. Um, and then with time for my master, I actually uh, worked with anemone, sea anemone, which is similar to corals but um, obviously a bit different um, and it was sea anemone back in Cornwall so completely different yeah. than coral reef <laughs> ecosystem um, but still really similar. Um, I knew I wanted to do something in marine but I kind of got lost because uh, I then went to Ivory Coast in Africa to work with chimpanzees. Uh, which was amazing, yeah. an amazing experience, um, and it was still conservation and uh, education as well. So we had uh, a camp back in the forest uh, for the guests to come and see the chimpanzee while we were doing some education um, about chimpanzee and conservation um, by having like guys in the forest following the chimpanzee all day. You're like uh, preventing poachers to come and maybe hunt uh, the chimpanzees as well. 
Um, so that's how I started. That was my first job. Uh, and then I had a few other jobs in Cyprus. I worked in France as well uh, on a project in the North uh, Sea and the Channel. Um, it was for Skate and Ray, uh, so a European project that happened at the same time as Brexit, for example. Mm. Uh, so not yeah. easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, always challenges. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was France, Belgium, Netherlands and uh, England. Mm. So it was to like, try and protect and how we can work together for the fisheries of skates and rays. Um, that's what I did and then after that I applied for a job at Reefscapers as a marine biologist and that's how yeah. I actually got it. Now you're here. Yeah, and now I'm here. So it takes a long time and it took me like a few years after my degree to actually get the jobs that like you know, was kind of my dream job. Mm. Um, so I would say don't give up and don't expect your first job after you need to be the perfect one. Um, I would never have had this job if I didn't have all the experience from other jobs before. Um, none of the jobs I've done before were like perfect. They were not really related to my field because I wanted to work with coral reef. Uh, but at the same time, that's where I learned a lot about education and that's where I found out that I want to do more communication and education. Um, so yeah, yeah, don't... Yeah, I think that's a nice message because I think often, especially when you're still studying and you're at the beginning of your career, you feel like every decision you make pigeonholes you even more. And actually, no, you can study marine biology and then work with chimpanzees later in your career. My master's supervisor did his PhD on mole rats I don't think he's looked at a mole rat since. Like he's now a leading expert on baboons worldwide. Yeah. Um, but he did. Well, I worked with him on sharks, and so your early career decisions do not define what you do. And we've had a similar-ish journey. But I actually, my undergrad was geography, so it wasn't even. I mean, it's an environmental science, but it wasn't even biology. I didn't even do biology A level, which always shocks people. Um, and it was my worst mark at GCSE as well. Um, and, but I liked it, um, but I didn't do it for A-level, I did geography. And then now I have a master's in conservation biology. Um, and I've worked with rhinos, I've worked with hyenas, now I'm working with coral reefs. And so you can move around, you don't have to be ocean or terrestrial. And your early decisions do not define your entire career. Um, and I agree, it's, it's hard and it's a long process and you can't expect your dream job to land in, in your lap. I mean, mine. I am. I feel incredibly lucky that yeah. this is one of my first jobs, um, sort of full time conservation jobs, post masters. But that was after eighteen months of lockdown in the UK, where I worked in loads of other random industries yeah. that weren't conservation. So, yeah, it's an interesting. It's always interesting. I find it really interesting hearing people's journeys, and I found it really useful. So I wanted to include that. Um, so to actually finish, the last couple question is. What can our listeners do to help Reefscapers? So do you want to talk a bit about our sponsorship programs and where they can find us on social media and everything? Yeah, so you can follow us on Reefscapers um, Instagram and Facebook <laughs> and LinkedIn and yeah. all of them. <laughs> uh, so Kate and I are doing most of the social media of uh, this account, basically. Uh, but to really help us and to help us protect the ocean, you can, uh, there's two options. You can actually adopt your own coral frame if you want. Uh, so we have different size. For example, the small one is about uh, one meter long. Yeah, it's quite big. Uh, it's, it's the smallest frame we have, but it's not small. It is quite big. <laughs> it is not small. Yeah, the small one is actually already yeah. decent size and it's already 41 coral fragment. Mm. Um, so you can either adopt your own coral frame, uh, you can buy it online and we can built it for you right here in the Maldives and then we will send you four pictures from four different angles every six months. Yeah, which I think is the best thing about adopting a frame because you can you can see the growth of your frame in real time. So every six months you'll see it and it is actually amazing to see the difference six months makes and how much bigger your coral fragments. Yeah. Yeah and you can see it from even less than six months. Yeah. Like when we go every all the times and you can see that they just grow like faster than you yeah, think a lot faster than you think yeah, yeah. really fast um, I'll make sure that Reefscapers website is linked everywhere um, where this podcast goes um, so that it's easy to find um, so yeah you can adopt your own frame and you can dedicate it to someone as well so or you can dedicate it to yourself you can do whatever you like um, yeah. but you then that is your own little part of 
the coral reef in the Indian Ocean that you own that's now yours, which I think is really cool. It is yours and it will stay underwater and it will be maintained by um, either us or by other marine biologists from mm. reef scapers like at least once a week and yeah. once a month. So it's in safe hands. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you can also adopt one coral fragment at a time uh, if you want. So we have like community frame where you can adopt your one coral uh, fragment. And once the frame is full, so if it's a small one for the one fragment, um, then we will build the frame and put it in the ocean as well. And it's the same, we will send you a certificate, the frame number, and every six months you get an update. Yeah, so you still get to watch your fragment grow. Yeah. Um, which is really cool. So that's a slightly more affordable way. Maybe if you've got some students listening who want to help, um, you can adopt just one fragment at a time instead of an entire frame. Yeah. Um, and if you're thinking about Christmas presents, if you're really early um, and organised, which I'm not, um, <laughs> maybe a coral frame would be a great present for someone this Christmas. Um, I know I would like to receive a coral frame. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, that will all be available, links everywhere, as well as your Instagram, um, I shall make available. Um, what is your Instagram handle for people? Is it just Amelie? Uh, mine is Amelie Carroll. Amelie Carroll, so you can find Amelie, and then you can also find all of the Biome podcasts, everything is also everywhere on social media, so the Biome Project on Instagram, uh, I think the same on Facebook, and then the Biome Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and then you can also find me on Instagram. So I'm conservation underscore Kate. And obviously, Roby and Emma are on here today. But if you want to catch up with them because you miss them so much, you can obviously find Roby Watkinson Wildlife and Emma Hodson Wildlife on Instagram as well. Um, so thank you, Emily, for coming on this podcast. It's been really fun to record this live. Um, we've co- recorded almost all of the podcasts so far over Zoom. So it's actually really nice to sit down and talk to someone face to face. Face your shit as well, yeah. yeah. We can think of uh, worse faces. So if you're listening to this and you've heard the ocean at any point, we are literally sat right next to it um, in a really beautiful spot. So this has been really nice to be able to record talking about our frames that are right behind us. Um, so that's really nice. So yes, thank you very much and we will see you next week.